outline today is just a brief overview of an AI tool. Um, we're going to do about 30 minutes focused on assessments with AI and then close up with some question and answers um, discussion from everyone here. So keep that in mind at the end. If you have something you want to talk about, bring that up at the end. Um, I just remind myself to record here. Oh, Tom already started it. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so we're going to do a brief demo today of Google Bard. Um, we've tried to kind of keep everything a little bit different throughout these. So can everyone see this Google Bard screen? We good? Okay. So basically Google Bard is really similar to ChatGPT and some of the other, you know, chatbots out there. They all have a little bit of different um, features. So far, I think Google Bard is pretty easy and straightforward to use. It looks a lot like ChatGPT. Um, if you just search Google Bard, it's going to be one of the first links that pops up. Um, so I just wanted to show you really quickly how easy it is for Google Bard to draft some multiple choice questions and then in turn kind of answer those questions. Um, just, you know, to kind of beware of having the AI do everything in the classroom, you know, do your job of creating those questions and do the student's job of learning everything. So it's super easy um, to use AI too much and kind of miss that whole learning process. So I'll just have it draft up here. Uh, write three multiple choice questions about Edgar Allan Poe. So here we have our three multiple choice questions that fast. We have what city was he born in? Um, which of the following was not a work by him? And then what was his cause of death? And then they give you the answer and everything. This first one even included a, a picture if you wanted to put that in your quiz. Um, and then it's super easy to just take all these again and say, just copy this first one here. Um, answer this multiple choice question. So we'll see if it gets it right. Yeah. And it even included a picture again. So it does a little bit more than chat GPT has been doing lately. Um, but again, just kind of like a cautionary tale of if you're going to have, you know, use AI to draft all these questions, think about how easy it is then for students to come here and just have the AI answer all the questions and then just completely miss the point of everything. So I just wanted to show that out. Has anyone had the chance to use Google Bard yet? Or any other of the AI? I mean, we've all heard of ChatGPT for now. You can yell it out if you've used anything. No Google Bard users yet? Okay. So I, let me... I tried it at some point. Um, I don't remember. Is it publicly available yet? Or is it still? It is publicly available. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it says I thought up it was here, like a closed beta. It was like an invite only beta when I was playing with it. So okay, I, yeah, you were an early user then. Yeah, I just went to Google. I searched Google Bard, and it's just uh, right here. Um, yeah, so I know some of them are like more. You have to make accounts and all that kind of stuff. If you're on Google here, it's pretty easy to get to. Um, but yeah. It's, I like, honestly, out of experimenting with all of them, because TLC has been playing with a lot of them, so far, Google Bard is probably one of my favorites. Um, I like this one a lot. Anything in the chat? Um, Tom's answer. Yeah, Tom's going to be monitoring the chat. So if he sees anything important, he's going to throw it out. But I'll bring this presentation back up for us. Okay, so that was Google Bard. Um, so just a reminder, Westchester University has no set guidelines for AI usage. It's all up to you as the faculty members to kind of make those decisions for your courses. Um, TLC has a teaching with generative AI toolkit, uh, with some very helpful sample guidelines, resources, and tools to help you out with AI. There are some syllabus statements, um, to get you started with what you might want to put in your syllabus. It's definitely something that you might want to start to think about for your winter or your spring courses. Um, if you haven't already put a statement in there about AI and Tom 
can probably throw that in the chat at some point during this if you haven't already seen this on the website. So now we are going to move into uh, AI in the assessment of learning. So I wanted to start with this quote just to kind of, you know, open up the fact that AI has been around for a little bit now, um, you know, in the the world of education. Um, and now almost every assignment at every level can be done, at least in part by AI. So that's a quote by Ethan Mollick. Um, so in the beginning, we were really focused on, you know, how can we, uh, you know, block AI from everything. Um, and it's becoming harder and harder. So really now there's no getting around AI. It can do a lot. Um, it's going to continue to get better and better. So we're going to be kind of focusing on how we can incorporate AI into, you know, creating assessments, the actual assessment and all of that. So like I just said, in the next 30 minutes or so, our goal is to kind of think about and discuss how we can incorporate um, or not incorporate AI into assessments. We want to consider um, where it makes sense to bring these tools into our instructional practices, because at the end of the day, AI is just another learning tool, um, like all the other tools out there. So last session, if you were not here, um, we talked about learning activities. And so those help students gain and practice, um, gain practice for what they're learning. So assessments are going to focus on the application of that knowledge. So they evaluate student learning and document progress towards meeting a specific learning objective. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with formative versus summative assessments. Um, so any of the examples we talk about today, um, or if you're thinking of an assessment, AI can really be applied to formative or summative. Formative are those ungraded kind of low stake um, things that you throw in, maybe like a weekly quiz, a poll, a rough draft, just to kind of like check where students are and make sure they're grasping the content. Your summative assessments are those like high stakes, you know, kind of like an end of the semester, final exam essay, a presentation, they're graded. And then that really shows you that students have met what you want them to learn. So we have brought this up a lot in our presentations. Um, where do you fall? So does anyone have any thoughts with where they are right now with AI usage? Are you a free use person, use with citation, use with permission, or no use? Um, and this is important to consider before you start incorporating AI into your assessment. So how do you, if you're going to allow students to use it, are they going to be citing stuff? Are they going to be checking in with you, keeping track of that information they're getting? Does anyone want to share where they fall? No, we have a lot of no use and some use with citation. So it looks like we're kind of tied between use with citation and no use at the moment. So we're kind of right in the middle here. Um, okay, so someone says uh, students are doing whatever they want anyways. Okay, so someone, Michelle said, okay with certain assignments, um, but she's having them cite. So yeah, it kind of depends on the assessment too. So take a second and think about an assessment you use in a course. It could be formative. It could be summative. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, something you do in one of your courses. And for your assessment, consider why you pick that assessment type. So whether it's an essay or a quiz, um, and then what will students gain from doing it? And just take a couple minutes to think about this and jot something down. Share it in the chat if you're comfortable. Okay, so Megan shared that she does a presentation to help students get comfortable speaking to, oh, went away, um, speaking 
to others about what they've learned in doing research, pulling information together. She says it's harder and harder to get them to move away from reading a manuscript. Yeah, and Arini brought up a good point. Um, it's obvious that students are using AI and how do we control it? Like Tom, it's it's almost impossible to control usage. Um, it's, you know, going back super a long time ago, it's kind of like when the calculator came out and there were people that were completely against using the calculator and now it's something we've just adopted to common use. Yannickin shared that she has students write a 250 word abstract of an academic article. Students gain the ability to paraphrase, demonstrate their understanding of the author's approach and identify key takeaways. We have a literature review. So thinking about those assessments, take a second and consider if students used AI for the assessment, would it disrupt your goals for student learning? If yes, how? And if no, what about the assessment prevents AI from disrupting it? Does anyone want to share what they're thinking about incorporating AI and how it could disrupt or how it could not disrupt? Yannickin, do you mind sharing? I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you mind sharing what you just put in the chat of how you kind of use AI there? Um, sure. And and as Andy pointed out, that's an assignment, writing an abstract of an article is an assignment that potentially an AI is pretty competent at. And so, I mean, I do, you know, ask them to, as part of that abstract, to say what their key takeaway from the article is, which uh, requires a little bit more personal reflection. But um, as a result, like I've, I, I wanted to demo it in class to kind of uh, confront the elephant in the room, like, well, let's see what chat GPT can do with this app, uh, writing an abstract, and then looking at that abstract compared to their own, and also um, still, like, unless you give a lot of parameters in the prompt, like, that abstract is, is really not that accurate. I mean, it'll, uh, the, the, the clearest evidence was um, it made up quotations from the article and then I said hey let's can someone find where this quote is in the article and like I could tell it was an article I've read like you know 30 times that I, I don't really remember that particular phrasing and and so it was a nice demo to show that like chat GPT was not a reliable way um of uh paraphrasing and summarizing um what an academic article is about I'm sure if you put in more sophisticated prompts it might do better Thanks for sharing that, Anakin. Yeah, um, that is, that's interesting that it was hallucinating quotes. I would try that again with Bard, which seems like it's it's tighter on that. Uh, with Claude, which a lot of people are using for that, right? The one from Anthropic. And Elicit, which is a tool that's designed for like research summarization. Um, yeah. <sighs> Like, yeah, I would be very curious because one of the reasons I'm curious about that, Yannickin, is like one of the things folks are talking about as like a use case for AI, like fairly smart folks, is as like a research assistant, like intentionally having it summarize stuff. Um, a lot of fairly smart folks seem to think that it will do it okay. But then the interesting question becomes, you know, are they like, what does that look like at scale? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm curious about that. So can you, can you put Andy, can you put some of the names of those other tools in the chat? Um, so taking um, that assessment you just thought about and some considerations here, if you are going to use AI in your assessment, there are a lot of things you want to consider before doing that. 
something I brought up earlier on was clarifying your use expectations. So are you going to have students cite it? Are you going to have them work in like a Word document and cite any changes? Um, that's a good way to keep track of things like detracts changes. Um, are you going to have them have no use? You want to make that clear in your syllabus or specifically in your assignment description. Um, you also want to consider that AI is a learning tool. Use it when it makes sense. Don't just use it. It sounds like everyone here hates AI and wants to ban it. Um, but if you are trying to use it, use it when it makes sense. Don't just use it because it's the hot new thing um, that goes for any tool. If you're going to use Flip, if you're going to use Padlet, have a good reason for actually using it as opposed to you know not using it. You also want to consider um, these students are going to be going into the job market soon. They are going to be using AI. A lot of us in the office use AI to do very mundane tasks like draft up summaries and that kind of thing. So we really do want to be preparing these students um, for the workforce wor for the workforce, and promote that AI literacy. So this is our chance to teach them how to use it ethically. When you're um, doing office summaries... How many hallucinations are you editing out? Well, we're giving it information from like a meeting and, you know, compile these bullet points into a paragraph. Yeah, but I mean, that's there. what Yannickin did, right? She fed it an article. Wait, Yannickin, yeah. did you feed it the text of the article or did you just give it the name of the article? Um, I just gave it uh, the name of the article. Ah, oh, that's what did it. Yeah, if you just give it so. the name of the article, especially ChatGPT has no internet access, it's just going to guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it's important it to review text, everything. Yeah. If you I mean, the there, there were like some pretty like uh, major renowned uh, historical articles in in the field of historiography, but I mean, yeah. Oh, I mean, no. Uh, I mean, you're yeah. right. It's, but it's still like, yeah. If you just give it a name, it's not. At least with ChatGPT, it's sure. not going to figure it out. Like, it's gonna. Yeah. Then it's definitely going to hallucinate. If you copy paste the text, which ChatGPT may not have enough context window for, but Claude does, then it will like summarize summarize that makes more sense um yeah i i just want to speak you know we've got a lot of folks who are like how do we stop this how do we stomp it out and i am i am i think i get painted as somehow an ai booster and that's not really true like i'm interested in ai i find it fascinating um i have a lot of critical responses to it um but i do think right that like the policing mindset here as with many other plagiarism issues is ultimately doomed to failure um, like what we have to do is explain to our students as best we can what the learning outcomes of an assignment are, like what the benefits are of doing it themselves, right? What they're going to learn, try to push them into a learning mindset rather than a banking mindset, right? Where it's not just like, I'm going to get this credential down off the shelf as easily as I can. Encourage them to think about the learning that they're doing and, and explain how doing an assignment is helping them learn and not just like, some you know producing this thing that's going to uh that's going to make a uh, a token for you to then give them credit for um it's hard that is hard work that is a big change to get students to think about process and learning rather than just like you know checking boxes and getting credentials i think especially a lot of our students are in that like mindset but breaking them out of that as best we can is ultimately i think as hard and as nerve wracking as it is, the only way we're gonna be able to sort of deal with this, right? Like trying to stamp it out, trying to police it, it's just, it's it's never gonna work. Yeah, I mean, we gotta, and that's what we gotta work on. We gotta help them with that. Like we've gotta help them find the way to, right? To, to, to learning to value that learning. Um, because honestly, if all they were after was a credential, they were already cheating. <laughs> like. You know, like they did, was it Madison, was it you who shared that study that was like, yeah, even before this, like 25% of like all college students admitted to like using some sort of plagiarism service or something. So there's I like- I think it's one of us in one of these. Know, yeah, might have been Anakin. that was, you know, that was a, a you know. A, you know yeah. So, so we, that's what we're going to have to work on. Yeah, that, that brings us up to a point that Tom and I discussed earlier today is, you know, why are students feeling the need to cheat? Is the, the grade tied to that assessment so stressful that they feel like, you know, if I don't cheat, I'm going to fail this class. I'm going to, you know, get kicked out of a program or whatever. Um, so that is a good point to bring up. Um, 
And back to on here, another, you know, this kind of ties in with what you were saying, Andy, encouraging academic rigor. So, you know, we, we might start have to encouraging better responses than we may have seen before AI, go beyond those basic, you know, multiple choice or, you know, those very easy questions and kind of step it up because now AI can help with those very basic things. Um, human input should complement AI. So have a good mix of human work versus AI work. And overall, again, continue to review your assessments. Are they standing up to the test of time? If you have an assessment that you haven't edited for the past two or three years, now might be the time to go back and look at those um, and consider how students are probably using AI to work on that assessment. Um, so Tom, um, Tom found this, so I'll give him the credit. He found a great quote from Ted Underwood, um, and it is that, I'll read it to you guys, one approach is to ask students to gather and interpret fresh evidence by doing ethno ethnography, interviewing people, digging into archival boxes, organizing corpora for text analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some things are actually easier now, and colleges may have to stretch students further in order to challenge them. So kind of talking about that academic rigor side of things, you know, kind of enhancing these assessments, these basic mundane things can be done by AI. Um, and so that brings us to how we can rely on AI to help support students as you push up that level of work and try to move students into doing more realistic, real world oriented tasks. Um, so here is a helpful chart that we found. You can screenshot it. Um, and this, all this will be recorded and posted online too, if you wanna come back and look at this. Um, but you might allow AI use for some of those more mundane tasks, like I said, and then you can start to kind of push up that level of Bloom's taxonomy in your objective. So this chart just shows the level of Bloom's here. So our six levels, remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create starting from the most basic to the more complex. Um, and it just shows how you can adjust the assessment to account for AI. So it says here, um, you know, we're trying to account for what AI can do. So uh, all course activities and assessments will benefit from review. Um, given the capabilities of AI tools, having students review their work and reflect on what they've done. Um, and those at the remember and analyze levels may be more likely to need amendments. So you might need to adjust some of those um, objective. So if you're having students just remember and recite information, AI is going to be able to do that. So moving into some assessment ideas of what we can do. One idea is to generate an assignment. Um, you as the professor can go on Google Bar or ChatGPT generate an assignment, um, have your students look at it, do a review of it. You know, is that what's wrong with the essay? They can do grammar edits. They can take a look at those sources and go more in depth. Um, they can make, make recommendations on improvements for that essay or whatever you have the AI generate. Another idea, um, so this one works so great with chat GPT, like we said, because it doesn't really search anything online. And that one is notorious for giving bad sources. Um, but this might be something that you could try out with Google Bard or one of those other um, AI tools that Andy shared. Generate some resource packs for a subject matter and have students take a look at those, evaluate the sources. That's a good way if your students are giving you crap sources to have them take a look at sources and see, you know, what's actually wrong with bad sources. Um, have them maybe replace the ones that are bad and go out there and actually find credible sources to replace those. Um, I think someone mentioned this in the chat, the idea of having AI generate topics and ideas. Um, so it is a good starting place to get some ideas going. If, you know, we've all experienced writer's block, you can go on AI now, get some ideas, and maybe you'll think of something new. Um, so have AI generate topics and ideas for concept maps. Have your students consider the relationship and weight of the evidence between the various concept ideas that came up. Um, another idea is AI feedback. So have your students write up their essay, whatever they're working on, and before they send it to you, have them submit it to AI for initial review and 
have them take a look at that feedback and see if it's worthwhile to adjust things in their essay. That also is going to save you time on, you know, having them submit multiple drafts of an essay that takes semester long to get feedback. Um, that's one way to speed up the process. And then our last idea is to debate the AI. So this one's pretty popular. Have students uh, chat with one of these chatbots, ChatGPT, Google Bard, whatever, Claude, um, whatever you want to have them debate. Have AI take one side, have the students take the other side. Um, if you want to see evidence of it, you could have them save the chat or screenshot the chat and submit that to take a look at it and see what, you know, if they were on the right side, if they were, you know, giving sources for their for the debate um, that makes sense and that kind of thing. Um, so think about that assessment you were thinking about again, maybe a new one. Um, have your thoughts changed at all? Is there anything you think you any way you can incorporate AI into your assessment, get rid of some of those mundane tasks and maybe push up the level of Bloom's taxonomy. Feel free to think about it for a couple minutes. Um, you can share it in the chat if you want or just yell it out. We don't have a huge group. So Andy shared in the chat that he can vouch for Elicit that it has um, quality sources. So definitely think about using that one if you're interested in that resource packs idea. So if no one has any, oh, someone wanna share? So one thing I do is I have my students create uh, assessments because that's the class on assessment. So one thing I could do is to have them have AI generate an, ass an assessment and then have my students critique it. Because <clears throat> as I said in the chat, the questions that AI came up with were wouldn't have met the criteria that I was that I have for my class. That's good. Yeah, that's I think that might be one we share in our AI toolkit too. having students generate an assessment and then kind of reviewing those questions, what it came up with. So just opening it up generally, any questions or thoughts or any experiences that anyone's had with AI? Madison, somebody has their hand raised. Oh, go ahead. Whoever has, I'm trying to find you in the chat. Okay. Oh, hi, Madison. This is one. I actually tried this attempt this semester. It created much more work for the instructor, but I really could see the improvement in learning outcome. I break down the assignment into discussion post, weekly discussion post, and then I pair student up to provide each other feedback. So I've been thinking about maybe I could use the sort of incorporate AI even more into this feedback mechanism. So they actually could perhaps use the prompts in the assignment guideline, in addition to the assignment guideline itself to see their own quote unquote human feedback versus AI feedback to their peers' work. Yeah, I that's a good I find AI use of AI helpful because uh, one of my class is about policy analysis. With that um, topic, there are numerous 
assignment that aim to help students develop analysis skill. So in the quote unquote problem statement formulation, I actually have a class exercise, have students compare the result of search result from AI. I just give them, I show them the result from various um, apps and then have students appraise which interface actually seems to be more reliable and also put in a critique about the limitation of the search result. So that's how I use it. I also require students to refer to use of AI if they actually do it. However, I find that if our assignment guideline is so quote unquote uh, specific in a way, a very strict parameter draw, then it's actually the use of AI cannot match up with the assignment requirement. Yeah. Yeah. We've definitely seen that playing around here in the office that the more parameters and, you know, the more detail that those, what you're asking students to do, the harder it is for AI to do for now, at least. Um, but yeah, that those are great ideas. Um, have you gotten any feedback from students? Oh yeah, they actually, that's, I put that in the chat after we compare the several different app student prefer BART the most. Okay. However, we also compare to the level of um, literature that I expect them to review, BART cannot really serve that function. So that's that experience. One Another course I asked students to do a evidence-based intervention program design. Yeah, we work on that assignment for a long time in the semester. AI provides students an, ex, uh, an example of how areas students need to consider in program design in a way that's kind of detailed, but it's, they are not always quote unquote right or on point. And I did not ask for those detailed info. So students took it as an example, but cannot really use the search result. Tom brought up an interesting question in the chat. Um, how many of you have tried putting your assignments into AI tools just to see what kind of answers you get? So Megan said yes for outlines for informative speeches. Megan, if you don't mind, what was your impression of that? Honestly, I cried the first time that I did it because I was so upset that <laughs> it was doing it really well um, and struggling with how to make sure students are getting something out of the outlining process of, you know, sifting through information and pulling it together. Um, but I think the structure that I have still holds pretty strong in terms of making sure they're following kind of a good pattern of creating um, a speech that is understandable for audience members and the outline that chat GPT um, spit back out wasn't, uh, it was more manuscript style rather than kind of an extemporaneous outline that, um, that the students are required to put together for their speeches. Megan, I have a question. Um... Have you thought about the idea of maybe having AI generate not only good examples, but poor examples, and then have the, the students evaluate, you know, compare and contrast? Yeah, I haven't had them do the compare and contrast with the ChatGPT outline yet. Um, I've had them do it with previous students' outlines and things like that. But yeah, I think adding in an AI one would be a good way to move forward. Anyone else put anything in to the AI yet? There are some privacy concerns using AI. Thanks, Megan. Uh, Marcus, do you mind sharing a little bit about what you did? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in May, I... I have been using ChatGPT since it came out in November, and I actually taught my students in early spring about that. I said, like, 
you're going to learn about this in your classes or you're going to use it from friends. And it was really interesting to see how they reacted in January, February and so on. I teach literature and I teach Latin American literature. So in one of my courses, I have they have to read a novel. Uh, I modified my assignment. I started reading a lot about how people were using um, artificial intelligence and assessments and so on. Uh, they had to do in the previous teaching methodology of that course, they have to write about the novel and about other stories that I read, but the major uh, assessment is uh, writing about that novel that we read throughout a month. So what I did is I divided during the summer uh, my assessment into four parts. The first part is a personal experience with X related to the novel. So they have to write about themselves. And that has been proved to be very, very interesting and in how they connect later everything to that personal experience. Um, funny enough, when I get students using ChatGPT or other tool, I have students recognize that they have even uh, asked ChatGPT to make up a story about how their experience with whatever. We're talking about injustices uh, and experiences with injustice. So they have to write a personal story. It's very easy. It's 5% of the grade. So it's just, I had this experience or friends had this experience, whatever. And, and it works really well. The second assignment then of the writing project is a summary of the first part of the novel. They have to, it's very structured. So it's not like write a summary. It's very structured about, you write about this, write about these characters. What do these characters do? Include two quotes about this, include one quote about how you prove this. Uh, and then, um, at the end, they have to make up how the novel will end. So they have to just foresee what will happen. The third assignment is a peer review, typical peer review bibliography related to the novel or the topic of injustice uh, systems. And it has been really well, have, it has been working really well. But then the final project, it's just combining all of them. It's like, talk about the novel, injustice in the novel, how you connect it to your personal experience and make sure that you incorporate the peer review literature into your analysis. So it's impossible when they get to the end of the semester to just make up everything. They have to combine everything they did. And at the beginning of the semester, they don't know that they will have to use that personal experience in that way. So they, they cannot just say ChatGPT like, or any other artificial intelligence tool, um, write an essay about this because it's not that anymore. It's like combine these structural assignments and write something that is coherent relating the peer review literature, the novel, and your personal experience. So that is very difficult to, to just make up. Um, and then I realized in May when I was working with that, that when you write, okay, write a summary or write about injustice in this novel, I teach a, a novel from Peru uh, and ChatGPT was confusing that novel with one from Mexico, written 20 years later with all the characters. So yesterday I was um, actually reading the reflections of the novel. And two students were writing from like about characters that don't appear in the novel, events that don't appear in the novel, and it's exactly that novel from Mexico. So it's very easy for me to just go to them and say, "Hey, you're writing about a novel that you didn't read." Then they confess, "Yeah, I didn't read it. I didn't have time." At this, so, and I'm very flexible. I tell them, "Hey, you 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 shouldn't have done that. Try to do it. Read the novel. Try to do it. I don't mind if you submit it two weeks late. Uh, I don't want to penalize students. Uh, there was discussion here about how they are stressed and this and that, and it's true." So I don't want to penalize them, just to tell them, hey, you shouldn't do that. Uh, just do your work, do it in an honest work, uh, in an honest way, and just submit it. That that's I'm working with that. Thanks, Marcos. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, Carrie asked if D two L is working on anything to detect it. Um, not really that we know of. It's really impo almost impossible to detect the AI usage unless, you know, like Marcos, you are seeing like, oh, they're talking about characters that aren't even in this or, you know, something completely unrelated to the assignment using your best judgment there. Um, any other questions or thoughts out there? Well, things are, while folks are thinking, I did just want to mentioned everybody that in January on the 17th, uh, the TLC is going to be hosting what we're calling Faculty Fusion Hot Topics with the TLC. We're going to have three different panels that morning, um, one of which will be AI related. And Andy, who has been on the call, has already agreed to be part of that panel. Um, so if this is a topic you're interested in and in continuing to learn more about, you might want to think about uh, trying to come that day for that for that session. Um, I am still searching for uh, some other panelists on that topic. So if that's something you might be interested in sharing your expertise about, reach out to me. Mm 
Mary, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys doing these sessions. And every time I come to them, I learn more things. And um, I'm not such a negative see about AI. Um, it is frightening teaching writing courses. So, and I teach writing 200 a lot, the research writing course. And I know how important it is to think about the skills. You know, we're trying to teach them argumentation and research and critical thinking. So I've been thinking, I love the ideas about, you know, having them write about their individual experience with something, if that can be incorporated. And I love the ideas about actually having them use chat or whatever, whichever one, to maybe elicit to do, look for articles and sources. Um, I'm thinking like, because I've seen other people do this, instead of having them write a 10 to 12 page research paper, have them do all the research stuff and then have them make like a visual project. So my question is, they'd still have to do all the argumentation. They'd still have to develop everything and have sources and all that. How hard would it be for them to, is there a way that some kind of AI could generate a talk? GPT-4 does that. Video or something like that. I mean, it won't do a video. GPT-4 will do any kind of still visual. Uh, right now, that's 20 bucks a month, but it'll probably be like there will be an equivalent that's free by the end of the year. Uh, if you want a video, that's much harder. I do think students are already, however, having an AI write a script for them and mm -hmm. then reading that even for like, I'm pretty sure I've gotten stuff that's like a Flipgrid response where they okay. don't want to turn their video on. They're just doing audio because they're reading a, an AI prompt uh, response okay. to the question on the on so the, what do you do andy when you see that it's a low stakes thing they don't want to do the learning in a low stakes formative assignment i'll nail them later like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go cop shit on right on a flip grid uh so but i'm yeah. talking like their research their big research project i'm talking like that do all so the, there's where we really have to we've got to we've got to pivot to process and we've got to think about like doing research as an end to itself, right? Talking them through different right. sources, having conversations with them about those sources, asking them follow-up questions in person if possible. Um, like, yeah, like there's no, nothing's gonna be perfect, right? Nothing's gonna, gonna shut it all down. I just would really hesitate against saying, well, if we pivot to this format, then the AI won't be able to do that format that gets you months at best, right? Probably less. Um, yeah. Well, they're charging a lot for enterprise users on Copilot. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens with that uh, for educational users. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't mean to dismiss the difficulty here, but the more that we can work on having those conversations with them, emphasize the learning goals, right? Ask follow-up questions, have discussions, um, the the better off we're, we're gonna be. It's not gonna be perfect, it's okay. just not. All right, thank but, you, that's, uh, that's good yeah. to know, thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? So we got in the chat, someone was having students do the work in class on paper. Um, but again, yeah, like they said, they're teaching online now. So that kind of proves a problem then. You could have them do it on paper and then snap a picture of the paper on their phones and send that to you. Uh, legibility problems become very real there. And it's not impossible to program a 3D printer to use a pen to do GPT output. Uh, but if someone goes to that effort, you should just, you should let them have it at that point. Yeah. <laughs> they get extra credit if they do that, because that would be pretty cool. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like Tom said, we don't have all the answers. Um, we're just trying our best to keep you all informed, give you some possible roads to go down. Um, check out that uh, Tom, did you share the link for our toolkit in the chat? I did earlier. Okay. And um, another teaser, uh, 
we have some AI uh, podcast episodes slated to come out later here in November uh, where we're talking through some of the things we've touched on today. So another another option for you to engage in some learning with uh, Westchester related folks. If you haven't heard enough of my voice already, you can hear some more of it. <laughs> Tom was avoiding saying that because he's trying to sell the podcast, but uh, it's uh, it is it is another option. And but Justin's on there too, and Justin's lovely, so you know that'll be fun. Don't threaten us with your voice, Andy. <laughs> Andy, uh, I I think you've got some interesting comments here, and it's actually making me think we should just not teach the research paper writing class at all and just teach the process of doing research and have them do the research and like what you were saying uh do oral presentations about judging the research and judging the types of sources and judging when one would use what i and think we definitely i think you're right about that i think we have to have a serious conversation about the form of writing instruction and its goals. We have to have a serious conversation about how, you know, I've really enjoyed um, John Warner's take on a lot of this stuff. I think he's a lot, had a lot of good things to say um, just about that pivot, the process. And um, I think that's hard. I think it's going to require a mindset change from faculty and students I think the being embedded in capitalism, as folks have pointed out, makes it harder. Uh, I wish I had a solution to that last one, but I don't. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, but I do think, I think across the, we, we really have to have a big conversation, it, both in first year writing and in the larger university writing space about like what, what does this look like? What are we trying to do? Like the calculator analogy is deeply imperfect. And I admit that, but there is to a certain extent, like how do we think about writing if certain parts of the writing process can in fact be automated? Like what do we do and how do we adapt to that? Yeah. And, and, and you know what, Andy? I mean, the positive of this is I think all of us sitting in this virtual room would say, we want our students to have the tools. We want our students to uh, know how to do things. We don't care that they, that's the whole point of the internet, that you don't have to have every bit of knowledge crammed into your brain, that you know where you can go to find it. And so, you know, we, we want them to understand the process and understand the critical thinking skills, which are much higher order than just writing some crummy chronological research paper and throwing in a few quotations. It, it's much more complex and important that the students understand the whole critical process of it and evaluating and judging. And Andy, you mentioned, uh, you said, John, is it Warner, W-A-R-N-E-R? Warner, he writes a bunch of different stuff. He's written for Inside Higher Education, but don't hold that against him. Uh, he's got, he recently trained a GPT clone of himself and had it write a blog post for him and then evaluated the results. Um, yeah, take a look at, I, I've I've found him... Um, you know, a, a very kind of informative read on this stuff. He's thinking about this in ways that I think resonate with what a lot of, a lot of what we want to do with writing instruction, you know, and the, part of this is just like, how do we, how do we use this as a moment to try to think about the ideals of writing instruction, what we want writing instruction to do and how can we, how can we get closer to that? Which, I, you know, I'd love to to be able to um, have those conversations. They're overdue, like even in the a pre uh, AI world, um, like a, a five paragraph essay is not a skill that students really need to have. And I mean, and we all know this. And this is something as I was, you know, I don't know if, for those of you who are following that the the back channel about the university writing councils kind of take on some of, some of this stuff. We know that too, but like, how do, how can we really read? I think the, the, those are really important. They're professional development questions, but they're also just kind of rethinking what, what is our goals? And um, I hope we can 
figure out how to have those conversations on this campus. Um, I think it's really no, I agree. And, and Yannick, it's an I don't oper- certainly... This is an opportunity yeah. for us. Yeah. Um, Let me just reiterate, I certainly don't hold it against, you know, you or anybody else sort of in that, uh, doing some of that professional development work. I know how hard it is to get folks to do those things. It's hard for folks in first year writing, you know, with our diversity of faculty, and then you multiply that to all the folks teaching writing across campus. And that is a, that's a lot of cats to herd, right? So um, yeah, like, I, I don't mean to um, downplay the logistical difficulties. They are serious, but I think it's still what we got to do. You know, we kind of, we kind of got to kind of have a, a come to, come to whatever deity you prefer or don't prefer a moment uh, and uh, and think about it. So on that note, we have about nine minutes left. If no one wants to share anything else, you can have nine minutes back in your day to think about AI. Thank you everyone for joining in too. I always want to share more things, but I'll respect everyone's time. <laughs> you I'll sit, listen for another on. nine minutes, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't feel like I have anything super compelling right at this moment. <laughs> you can share it at the panel. And and please do all of you mark your calendars for that uh January 17 event. Uh, we'll be talking about AI, but also um we have uh, pedagogy of care and yeah. addressing microaggressions in the classroom. It yeah, should be a really, really uh, useful stuff. event uh, to kind of think about jumping in, you know, starting the semester off strong. Um, so Are those panels going to be concurrent or consecutive? Consecutive. consecutive. Oh, awesome. I can go to the other ones. Yeah. That's that's exciting. Yeah, it should be a really great day. Um, hope you can uh, reserve it. We know January is always hard. Uh, 